Hello. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for coming to the Better Talk. Um, I hope they didn't hear that. Um, my name is Drake. I am uh, a researcher at Sprung Studios, and I'm going to be talking about analyzing intensive longitudinal methods uh, using, uh, yeah, using multi-level modeling. Oh, there, you are. there I am. Yeah, what's up? Oh, they couldn't see me. Oh, that's too. That's too bad. Um, okay, great. So let's get into it. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this talk. Uh, I feel like everybody here has vested interest and is kind of a nerd, so I appreciate you coming. Uh, mixed methods are a big, uh, big part of what I've been doing as a as a researcher, and I think everybody should be doing mixed methods. This isn't working. Oh, that's a bummer. Thanks, Kay. Kay's on my Sprung team, and he does all the AV stuff. Uh, is it not plugged in or what's going on here? Beauty Brilliant. Okay, cool. All right, let's get into this. Um, where am I from? Who am I? What am I doing here? Uh, I am from Sprung. Sprung Studios, if anybody is unfamiliar with it, Sprung Studios is. They are a premier co-development company uniquely specializing in UX UI design uh, for video games. And they have been in business since I was 12 years old. So they have a lot of industry experience. I was in grade seven playing Yu-Gi-Oh cards at that time. So well experienced in the design field, but they are also a research-driven design studio. So we are a research team as, as uh, I, I'm the fourth on the team, but now we're just blow, ballooning up. So we've got a lot of research-driven design here. And so who am I? Uh, I am Drake. I am a user researcher. Uh, I have seven years of experience in intensive longitudinal methods. Uh, I did my master's and PhD in health psychology, and I've been conducting daily diary studies and intensive longitudinal methods uh, for a while now. So I kind of brought that into the team, and we've been developing that service a lot at, at Sprung. And so I'm not a designer. You will notice this throughout. The slides are not great. Our designers had nothing to do with my slides, so do not judge them on my, my work. And I'm going to try my best to have a good presentation here and not, keep this, not make this boring. So uh, please join me in this adventure. Uh, it's time for another. I say this. I, I've been looking for more Daily Diary content, and there was two really awesome uh, previously uh, presented at, at GER Summit, uh, and that was in 2016 and 2019. If you haven't seen these, these are phenomenal and really good resources to talk about. Um, they talk about different approaches to Daily Diaries, um, but I take a little bit of a different approach today. I'm going to be a little bit more looking into uh, the analysis side and why you should be using MLM. Uh, I'm going to start with a scenario. You're in a meeting, uh, and the conversation comes up of whether or not new and existing players are experiencing your game the same way. Uh, and so as intelligent researchers, uh, we might throw out some ideas as to how we would measure this. Uh, and so a 14-day diary study might be something you shout out. Uh, you might be talking about player sentiment or you know, recruiting two different groups and then testing them. So that's great. In a, in a perfect world, you do that. You run that 14-day diary study, and then you have findings, right? So let's talk about what those findings would be after you run that study. What would you do first? Step one, you'd probably visualize the data to explain what was going on. Uh, and you could, have, you could visualize it by looking at the average player enjoyment across the two weeks, OK? So it might look something like this. You're looking at veteran players here in the blue and new players in the orange. It looks like there might be a little bit of a difference. It's blocked off a little bit there, but you can, uh, there is a little bit of a difference here. So you're like, OK, maybe I need to look into this. Maybe there is a difference between what veteran players and new players are experiencing. I acknowledge fun is a, is a controversial topic, so we'll not get into that. <laughs> Sean, thank you. Uh, so this is just an example. Don't worry about it. Um, step two would be you would analyze it, right? So you run a linear regression, right? So you, the idea is you're going to run a linear regression. And what do you find? You find that there is, in fact, a significant result. Uh, it looks like new players are decreasing in their enjoyment across the 14 days. Awesome. This is really great, right? So what do you do next? Step three, action on those findings. You're going to go and you're going to ship that, those results. You're going to talk to your team. You're going to make big changes. The results are in. New players hate the game. We're moving forward with that information, right? <laughs> good. We're good, right? Step four, probably going to be regret because you just realized that you weren't thinking about this presentation that you heard a way, ba way, ba way back at Ger Summit where we talked about multi-level modeling. You may have made a critical error here. And uh, that significant result is actually insignificant, uh, or non-significant. I don't want to call it insignificant. That's mean. Um, so 
you didn't run a multi-level model, that is a problem. And I'm going to explain to you throughout this process uh, why this is a problem. And it'll be very clear as to what was going on here and why you shouldn't do this in the future. If you have done this, it's OK. Um, we'll figure it out. Um, what am I selling today? I am selling why I hate the term diary studies. This is a very minor tangent that I think is necessary. It has nothing to do with a lot of what I'm talking about today. But I don't like diary studies. I don't like the name of it, even though we sometimes use it a lot. <laughs> um, 10 easy steps to run an intensive longitudinal method study. So I wanted to do a quick, like, abbreviated conversation about how you'd run this and a couple tips uh, in each step of like, what I would recommend. Um, just because some people aren't familiar with the, with the methodology, and it's great to have that kind of uh, introduction. And then I'm going to talk about how and why your analysis, analysis, analyses should be using multi-level modeling. Uh, and then I top that off with a little bit of actionable insights that you could be using, or some ideas to spur you as a team as to what you might want to do when you're running an intensive longitudinal method, a daily, daily diary study, or whatever. So we're going to be sprinkling on a little bit of sprung UX on this presentation. And we're going to be using, anytime we use, this, uh, use examples from what we've done, uh, it's coming from a, just a pilot study that we ran exclusively for this presentation on a, a mobile TCG. So I'm not going to talk about the TCG. I don't care about the TCG that we ran. It's not the main, main, main focus. It's more about the results and the way that we, we actioned on these results. So I keep saying intensive longitudinal methods. What am I talking about? Uh, it's time to let the cat out of the bag. Diary studies are not the best way to call these things. We've been using diary studies too long. Everybody uses it, not just this industry. This is like an academic, this is just a plague across all research. Uh, diary studies are wildly um, simplifying what we're doing, I think. Uh, and sometimes we are running diary studies. That's the problem. Sometimes people are running diary studies, and sometimes they're not. Uh, and so intensive longitudinal methods is an umbrella term. Um, it is a way to describe different methodologies that use intensive longitudinal designs. And so intensive being you're measuring a lot of things, a lot of times, and then longitudinal across time. Uh, so daily diaries does that, but generally speaking, when you actually define di daily diaries, or some people define diaries, that is strictly qualitative in nature. It, it sounds like what it is. Uh, lay people will assume that you're writing out diaries every day, and sometimes that is the case, but sometimes it's not. So you're maybe using the wrong term and maybe confusing lay people and researchers as to what the actual design you are using. And so does the language matter? I think it does. Um, when I was a kid, my dad was a mechanic. He wasn't really a mechanic. Um, but he asked for an Allen screwdriver. And I said, OK, I got you. Here it is. And he's like, I asked for a Phillips. I, I said, actually, I didn't even know that there was a Phillips. Like, I thought there was a flathead. I had no clue. I still haven't understood what a Phillips. And I had to look it up on Google literally before us to look up what an Allen screwdriver and a Phillips screwdriver looked like. Um, this is the exact same energy as handing somebody a diary study and then saying, oh, actually, I asked for a daily diary study. But they didn't ex understand that, oh, I was just giving you qualitative, but they wanted quantitative and qualitative. Because you just don't communicate. There's, no com there's a lot of like, confusion as to what's going on. This is the very same energy, in my opinion. Um, we're just giving them what we think is, a is what they want, and we have no clue. So you have to define these things and make sure it's very clear to everybody what's going on. So diary studies just doesn't cut it. Um, the next step for this presentation is to be how to run an, an intensive longitudinal method in 10 steps. It's going to be quick. Um, but again, I'm trying to give you tidbits throughout to give you ideas of how to, how to get through this uh, and to run an efficient intensive longitudinal method. Step one, define research goals. So, the main step here is to determine what your team wants to get out of this, this study. Uh, with intensive longitudinal methods, you're testing across a, a long period of time, right? So generally speaking, I run two-week studies, so 14 days. Uh, you can run things like Lainey for 10 weeks if you're really ambitious and you, <laughs> you want to kill yourself. <laughs> she, she is a, a really good resource if you want to talk about like some really long-scale ones. Um, but depending on what you're looking at, uh, this will, you know, orient what questions you ask and how you design your study. So you can look at things like retention. This is a really big uh, metric that you can use because you're looking across time. You're looking at that two-week window, right? The sweet window where you have players either engaging that are brand new to the game that you want to see whether or not they're going to stick. Um, or you can see things like player sentiment, player motivation, or changes in behavior across time. Really cool insights that you can gather. But you need to define those research goals. And so what are the main, some of the main goals of our study? Um, with ours, with our pilot study, we just, you know, we ran, 
we looked at churn, so we looked at retention, of course. Uh, we also compared groups, so you can compare TCG players and non-TCG players. Um, this is great when you're thinking about your, your game. Who are the, the, what are the demographics that you're trying to cover on, on your game? Do you think that a specific group will be playing the game more or enjoying the game more? And if there's a specific group that you're worried about uh, acquiring or, or maintaining across your, your game, then you can assess that too. And then we have player engagement metrics. Um, so player engagement metrics can be things that are specific to your uh, specific genre, right? So for, for TCGs, um, common things that are popping up in TCGs today are battle pass progression and building decks and, and acquiring new cards, right? So these are things that are common to TCGs. Uh, these are things that you'd want to measure. Like, how are people interacting with these? Are they motivated by these things? Uh, that's what you can look at. Uh, determining the appropriate design is where this really comes down to the language thing, right? So you can determine how you're going to do it, uh, and this is going to this is going to be this is going to be the most interesting part, in my opinion, of like where you're setting up your study. Uh, so interval contingent design, there's, there's four designs, and I'm going to propose a fifth design that you can use. Uh, interval, in, interval contingent design is when you record experiences at a predetermined time, a regular time, across every day. So you're setting up a schedule to get the end of day results one to two hours before the person goes to bed. Right? I tend to use that as my, as my go-to for interval contingent because you're getting a summary of the day as the time they're wrapping up their day. Uh, yes, you do lose a little bit of that recall, like, time period where the recall bias might be a little bit higher, but you're getting a summary of the day and they're getting a global perception of what, what went on. Depends on how long they're playing the game and when they're playing the game, but this might be a really good option. Event contingent design is when you have participants record every time a predefined event occurs. And so an example being every time you sneeze, you're going to pull out a survey and you're going to respond to that survey, right? So what happened? Was it an allergy? Was it, uh, did you almost not sneeze? Like, was it enjoyable? All those things you could ask in event contingent design. And you can do that with games too, right? So when an event occurs, you specify that this is the exact event that I want you to res respond to, and so they'll pull up the survey and do it. This relies on the participant to do a little bit more work on their end to acknowledge when this is occurring. Um, but it is an effective way to get at uh, specific events. If you really want to know what's going on, like in a mission or something like that, that's event contingent where it's beneficial. And then you have signal contingent design. Signal contingent design, if used properly, is awesome. Uh, if used improperly, can be really problematic. Uh, so that's basically when you, as a researcher, will either randomly or you'll choose a time period to send out um, surveys. And so this is really effective at getting random time points where you can actually pinpoint what's going on at that exact moment. It's really, really good for that. But if you don't know when they're playing the game, this is a horrible design, right? So if you're, if you're pinging people for surveys two or three times a day and two out, of th two out of three of those times they're not playing the game, you're just wasting data. You're wasting your time and you're wasting participants' time. Uh, so making sure that you know where, if you, if you have a fixed time point for players playing a game, then you may be able to use this, and it might be an effective way to go about it, to get those, those insights with very minimal recall bias. The last one, this is, these, these were uh, built out from a book in 2013 called Intensive, Intensive Longitudinal Methods, uh, and uh, they were talking about how device contingent design is going to be the next fad, uh, and this is when smartphones were getting popular. Uh, so there's, device contingent is basically allowing us to use this technology that we have now to effectively uh, give surveys throughout the process. And so smartphones allow us to do this with pairing things like uh, heart rate monitors or GPS, so if you think of like Pokemon Go maybe, if you travel a kilometer, you might get a survey and saying like, were you happy with your experience? Something like that. You can pair this and be creative with this. Uh, and then like with heart rate, if your heart rate goes above 120, you should fill out a survey and not go to the doctors. Um, so that's, that's the fourth one. And then I'm gonna propose telemetry contingent design. I don't know if it's the best terminology for it, but I, I, it works for me. Uh, and so telemetry contingent design is, is more or less like perfect for what we do as games user researchers. This is pairing telemetry polls and events to trigger surveys. So if an event occurs in the game, you can pull that telemetry, and that telemetry will then trigger a, a survey to be sent to your participant while they're in the study. Uh, and so this will allow you a lot of freedom to change the types of surveys that you're using specifically to the events that are occurring in the game. So an example being you die 10 times in Dark Souls on a boss in a row, you are now going to get a survey that's asking about that specific boss. This is a really cool way to do it, and I think it's something that we haven't really 
explored much in, in the industry, but I think this is where we're going. And so our, we're working on this right now at Sprung, and I think it's really cool. Okay, what do we do? We just use inter interval contingent design. We asked them one to two hours before bed. Uh, and the benefits of this were that uh, for the current study, it was flexible for participants' schedules. Um, mobile games can be played in multiple sessions throughout the day, so we can kind of just get a summary of the day. Uh, and then uh, assessing experience across the day allows players to recap all of those sessions. So we just were curious about their overall, uh, their play. And so step three and four, <laughs> zipping through these. Sampling strategy and frequency. I'm not gonna talk too much about this. Just make sure you sample the right group. Uh, and data collection frequency, this is where you determine how long you wanna, you wanna assess your participants. We do 14, we do 14 days frequently because we like that kind of time period. The seven days is really important, but giving that extra seven days really gives you an idea of like longevity. Uh, and we always do, uh, with intensive longitudinal methods, at least with what I'm recommending, we do a preliminary survey and a, and a final survey that allows for a lot more detail in what's going on, especially that final survey. That's where you get a lot of feedback about general perceptions of the game, motivations, all that stuff. And then you can ask trait-like things. So things that won't change on day-to-day -day basis, you ask that in the preliminary. So you know, personality, uh, genre preference, all those things, get those in the preliminary. Measures and instruments. I'm also not gonna talk about this. This is up to you. This is the fun part as a researcher. You determine what you wanna find. Uh, quantitative, qualitative, I highly recommend using mixed methods. The advantages of quantitative, very fast. Uh, you do not wanna overburden your participants when this, during the study. So you wanna use quantitative when you can and qualitative as scarcely as possible. You make sure that your qualitative questions are really getting at what you need. Uh, and then observational, again, Go to Lainey's talk if you want to talk about observational stuff. That's really cool. We didn't do it, um, but she did an amazing job of, of recapping how, how they went about it. Uh, set five, six, seven. Yeah, we're, we're just moving at an accelerated rate right now. Um, developing study protocols. Participant communication is really key. So you need to determine how you're going to communicate with your participants. Make sure you know. If, that didn't, if that's not something you thought about before, think about it a little bit now, because you need to figure out if you're gonna text them, email them, if you think they're reliably gonna check their emails, that's something you need to consider. Um, and I think texting is just like 100% the way to go, if you're, but I do both for redundancy purposes. Um, and uh, figuring out what programs to use and things like that for those uh, pre-scheduled texts and emails is really important. Data collection tools and methods, again, same thing. You do your thing. Missing reports is important. You need to have a protocol to figure out what you're going to do if a participant's not responding uh, and when. So early on in the study, the first three days, pivotal. Make sure that your participants are responding. You want to know if they're, they're not responding to the study because they don't want, they're not getting the survey or if they're just not doing the study or if they're bouncing off the game. So you don't want to misinterpret it as they just don't like the game when it was actually they just didn't do the, the surveys. Um, and lastly, missing data. Not going to talk about that. That's a whole... That's, different thing, um, but make sure you have processes whenever you're analyzing your data to do missing data. I can talk at length with that, about that. That's not for today, though. Um, does anybody know who this is? This is a pilot test, so just do it, okay? That's all I have to say about pilot tests. Um, recruit participants. One thing I'm going to say recruitment, again, you guys all have your different processes of how you would recruit participants, but the main thing is, is talking about the study briefing. This is essential when it comes to daily diary studies. Others, it might not be so much, but you really need to hammer home all of these like talking points, and you need to kind of build rapport with your participants. So talking about study process, time requirements, expectations, the compensation, consent, and all that boring stuff, but then leaving time for Q&A for participants is really key. They need to know what they're getting into and what their expectations are. That's super pivotal. And it, the benefit of this is hidden right here, uh, is it builds rapport and it significantly improves the quality of the data. They are more involved with this process if they know there's someone there, right? If they've talked to that person, they know the significance of why they're doing this study and what they're expected to do, really important for actually improving the quality of the data. And it reduces the missing data that you're gonna have to deal with later on, and it reduces the amount of bad actors that you're gonna be recruiting, right? So you can definitely weed those out pretty quick. And they're just more, more invested in the study. Implementing data collection, this is where you're done. You've, you've set up the study, the study's running now, and now what you're gonna do is basically just let it run, let it come in. One recommendation I have for, because a lot of this stuff, you're gonna, you're gonna be using qualitative data, make sure you start running your, con, uh, conducting your thematic analysis midway. Why waste so much time on the back end of setting up your theme, setting up your codes, and figuring out what's going on? You have a large swath of data by halfway point. So use that data, set your themes up, set your coding schemes up, and then run it after, uh, and then you just finish off the, the thematic analysis afterwards. 
Analysis time, choose appropriate statistical methods. This is where we're going to jump into a lot more of the heavier content, so I'm excited for that. Um, choose the appropriate set statistical methods. You should be having flashbacks right now, thinking about when you said new players hate the game, right? This is pivotal. We made the mistake, let's not make it again. So we're going to talk about multi-level modeling after this. And then lastly, interpreting report results. We're going to talk about that as well with the analysis portion, or the, uh, the insights portion. But your job really, in the end, is to do complicated analyses, understand these complex relationships, and don't keep it complicated, right? Simplify it for the people that are going to actually action on these things. Uh, that's really, really important. Write that simple report. Because if you're just doing all this just to show amazing statistics and how confusing things are, it's not going to hit. It's not going to do anything for your team. My job, of course, is to explain why MLM is important and then give examples of what insights you can explore. It's time. <laughs> Let's talk about multi-level modeling. It's finally time. Um, this is why we're here. Non-independence is something you must must, must account for when you're collecting any type of intensive longitudinal studies. Anytime you're doing repeated measures or testing multiple groups, you need to be counting for non-independence. If you don't know what non-independence is, let's talk about it. What do you think the biggest predictor of how much you weigh today is? Does anybody know? Oh, you guys are good. <laughs> you're so good. Uh, <laughs> How much you weighed yesterday? If I had to guess everybody's weight here, that's the one question I would ask. How much you weigh yesterday? Uh, and that would give me much better validity and much more, more consistency across what, what I'm going to get on those guesses, right? So how much you weighed yesterday is 100% uh, non-independent, right? So you are not an independent, like your weight from today to tomorrow is not independent, right? They're very heavily correlated. This is exactly what happens within studies. You have scores from day to day that are not independent of each other they are heavily impacted by what you did yesterday uh, and by who you are as a person. Another example would be if you like extraction shooters similar to Escape from Tarkov. If I had put all of you in this room and I forced you to do a two-week study on EFT, uh, everybody has different opinions on what kind of, how they like that game. So some might love that game, some might hate that type of game, uh, and you will carry that into the study, right? So your scores will be more consistent and you'll have within person consistency across that study. And so you need to account for that when you run your analyses. You can't consider each data point, each row of data as independent from others. It, you just cannot do it. That's what leads to uh, mis misinterpreting data like we did in the beginning. And so there's day-to-day -day fluctuations as well. You know, if you had a really bad day, you just got completely crapped on and like you had a horrible time, your next day you're probably going to be lower than usual as well because it's going to carry over to your, your next reports. Uh, another just quick example of just like how you can see like all this non-independence. I used to do relationship studies where I'd look at stress couples uh, and see how they manage stress and, and cope with stress. Uh, so there was non-independence at the couple level. We look at dyads, so different, different groups of couples. Your, your relationship, you can think of your partner, how you guys handle stress. It's going to be different than I, how I handle stress with my partner, right? And so our levels are going to be different. Again, the individual is, is, is more similar, and there's a lot of non-independence in there, and then across those time points as well. So talking more statistically heavy here, um, MLM versus OLS. OLS is ordinary least squares, and essentially it's a method that's used in statistics to find the best fitting line or curve through a set of data points. So something like this, you see it all everywhere. Whenever you're running linear regression, you're probably running OLS. Um, but MLM is an approach that's made to deal with this non-independence that we were talking about. And clustered data is another way to call it. Uh, so in this example, there's a level of enjoyment predicted by money spent. This is all made up. <laughs> it's not real. Um, money spent is on the x-axis, and enjoyment is on the on the on the y. And so it looks like, yeah, the as you spend more money, you're happier, right? You're enjoying the game more. And so from that looks fine. It looks looks good. Looks looks reasonable. You might have, if you have a keen eye, you might be like, okay, well, there's something weird going on at the six to eight dollar price point. Don't really know what's going on, but you wouldn't really be able to tell with this OLS. Um, that's OLS. That's what it is. Uh, but if, if you're taking an MLM approach, you might be considering different things, different clusters. Uh, and so again, completely made up. This is completely made up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you had COD players, Sims players, and Candy Crush players in this study, you might actually be able to find out that the big reason why there's a dip there at 6 to 8, it wasn't because the price point was, was bad for players or they didn't like that price. It may have just been that the cluster that was that was experiencing that was in that area was actually having a completely different interaction with the game, right? So 
these Sims players who may not like to spend that much money but are willing to spend a little bit, they actually might see a decrease in enjoyment as they spend more money. Whereas COD players or, or Candy Crush players might have that enjoyment as they increase, but uh, at different, different levels, right? So the COD players spend less and the Candy Crush players spend more. Again, made up data. Um, yeah, so what's then another reason why you should run MLM outside of non-independence and accounting for non-independence? Unique player journeys across time is something that you need to account for. You're, you're, you're spending so much time and investment on getting this data about players across time periods. You want to know what's going on and what those unique journeys are. Uh, so that within person experience. Uh, and so one question we, we asked is, are players motivated to unlock cards across the first two weeks? And so if we ran an OLS, uh, we got, <laughs> I took out the data points just to be extra like clear that this is like not the best. Um, this is what we'd see, right? This is the regression line. If we were just looking at the regression line, it looks like, yeah, motivation is kind of like stable. It like it doesn't change much. Uh, and that's okay. Um, but what do we need? We need spaghetti. We need spaghetti for this to understand it. And so spaghetti plots are these jumbled messes. And it doesn't look good. This is, I would never recommend showing this to, to anybody. <laughs> but you do need to look at this. Uh, I think spaghetti plots are really good for that initial step of looking at your analysis. What are we looking at? What is this? Each individual purple line here is an individual player's regression line across the study. Okay, So this is their unique experience. You're seeing that there are some players that are significantly dropping, some that are high, that are stable, and some that are like really low, and they just drop off. They, they left the study, right? So you're seeing these unique journeys, and you need to identify that as a, as a, as a researcher. This isn't going to be something you, would, you do for an analysis, but it gives you an idea of what your data is looking like. There might be some like significant clusters here where there's like different trends, and you'd be like, OK, why are there different trends in the spaghetti plot? Uh, and that's where you can kind of start investigating. So recap, um, why should we use MLM? Uh, ignoring clustered non-independent data is bad. It's just bad. Um, it can lead to a lot of problems. And it gives a lot of perspective into unique player journeys. Um, what problem does it solve? It solves avoiding misunderstanding complex patterns of data. So we really oversimplify uh, some data if we use OLS by using these averages across the study, and that can be really problematic because you're just you're not use, utilizing the data that you've spent so much time to collect and to investigate. Uh, and it allows for research to f researchers to fully utilize the complex data that they have gathered. Again, reiterating what I just said. All right, let's discuss insights. Uh, I don't know how much how much time am I working with. How much? I have 35 minutes left. Oh my God. <laughs> I need to slow down. My God. Um, wow. OK, I'll take my time with this. Um, uh, so examples of actionable insights. Um, these are some things that you can ask, ask as a researcher. And these are kind of things that you can report uh, to your teams. So what is motivating players to play daily? When do we lose players? Who likes or dislikes the game more? So this is where you're looking at these group comparisons. I think that's really fun. And then the why is uh, why are players disliking or liking the game more? So one thing you can do is uh, you can separate these into the game mechanics, like I said. So, so some game mechanics that we investigated for the, the TCG were unlocking cards, gameplay, progressing a battle pass, daily missions, building new decks, and then this is checking the store, because that's relevant for a lot of just developers to make sure that people are checking the stores or they're motivated to check the store. Um, this lowly little line right here is checking store. Um, and then these two are building new decks and progressing the battle pass. So this is telling you the average across all players across the 14 days, right? So where are the trends? What are they experiencing as a whole, as a group? And so this is actually kind of alarming. So the scale was from 1 to 6, 6 being strongly motivated, uh, and then uh, 1 being strongly unmotivated, uh, or strongly disagreed to being motivated. Uh, and so this is a bit of a, a question mark and alarming here, because uh, building new decks is a huge part of what TCGs are about. right? So that's a big mechanic that some players should be motivated to do, uh, and they're not. They're not in this case. So that's something that we would want our, our team to know and trying to investigate further as to what's going on exactly. And obviously, these are you know 
across the days. You, you, you can see in the background, there's also like the daily averages. So those are really interesting to see if there's peaks and valleys uh, to understand what's going on at what times. Are they super high, like are they heavy loaded to the top and then they decline across time? That's also something you need to consider whenever you're doing multi-level modeling. That's where you can do those regressions. But I like to keep this in mind whenever I'm doing these studies. Uh, if you haven't seen a facet grid before, there, there's like you run them all the time whenever you're doing daily diary studies. So basically, a facet grid is just looking at each individual person. So each group, each uh, graph here is an individual person's journey across the across the 14 days. And so this is their motivation to engage in unlocking cards. And so when they unlock cards, uh, you see that like some are highly motivated at the start and then they de decline across the, across the study. Some aren't motivated at all and then it's just spikes. So everybody's having different experiences so you wanna know what's going on and then you can compare different groups on what uh, their, their, their journeys look like. So there may be some different like clusterings going on based on if they're TCG players or if they're non-TCG players or if they're new players or veteran players. And so, yeah, they're one player's experience. So churn, something you can do is look at churn and, and retention rates. Um, one thing that you can do is uh, look at the number of players. So we, we had old players and new players, so those are pre-existing and new ones. And we want to see, is there a critical point where players are dropping out? That they're stopping playing the game or reporting not wanting to play the game anymore. So there's different ways to identify churn. You as a team need to develop what you think is churn. Uh, is it not playing for a few days? Is it just ceasing playing at all? Is it n it's saying that you don't want to ever play this game again? You got to determine that so that you can assess this. Uh, and that's the fun part. But for us, we looked at this and we found that for new players, there was a significant decrease while the old players were just, you know, they were steady as ever. Uh, and so the sharpest drop in new players occurred around day seven. So we're seeing that like around day seven, that's a significant drop in new players. This is a pivotal time, right? So we need to make sure that we're doing a better job at the first few days to keep those players engaged, to keep them involved and figuring out what they, why they're dropping out is kind of what we need to do. And that's why we collect qualitative data. So we'll be able to look at that. Um, one thing that we did that I really like is um, looking at the, the number of issues that occurred as an indicator of when players are going to start dropping out. And so you can code all your qualitative data. If you're doing thematic analysis, you code them effectively so that you have uh, an actual amount that you can quantitatively use in an analysis like this. So we have a number of reported issues per minute. So per minute played, we looked at how many issues people were reporting. And we found that after day seven, it's, it's unfortunate. <laughs> this, these graphs are cool. I should have put them on the left side. Um, the graph spikes at day seven uh, for new players. So after day seven, around the time that we said like a lot of them were, were, were wanting to drop out, uh, we also saw a spike in, in grievances and, and reports. of So those that stuck around had a lot of issues. Uh, and that, that really spiked to the point where they're experiencing almost one, pro one issue or reporting one issue in their qualitative reports per five minutes of gameplay. So every five minutes, they were, they were complaining about it. They were either playing really short periods and complaining, or they were playing for you know, middle, middle amount of periods, but they were also complaining a lot. So we, we saw a lot more issues uh, per minute for the new players. Interesting insights. Day seven is a critical period is, is what's, what's popping out here. Now, who liked who who liked or disliked the game is something that you want to know, right? You just don't you don't just blanket uh, uh, everybody together and say that oh yeah everybody's dealing with this everybody hates the game. It's not the case, right? There's certain players that are more engaged or least less engaged in the game. So ways that you can assess this is looking at engaged versus unengaged players, and I'll talk about how you can determine that. Uh, or you can look at specific genre types, which I, I like to do as well. So talking about demographics that you're interested in. So how would you do engagement and how would you determine engagement? There's two approaches to this. Both are valid, um, but one takes a little bit more future planning and one's more reactive. So there's pre-existing beliefs about players. So this is your team can determine whether or not your, your game has different groups of players, right, that are engaged in different ways. If you think about a game, you know, a live op game, you might have like a significant group of players that play a ton, that are power users, and you're really curious about them. And then you might have, you know, the dads of the world or the mom and dads that have like one to two hours every night. They're spending that one or two hours consistently on the game, but they're very different users. So you want to recruit those different groups. So it requires you to have that foresight and to know your player base. If you do, 
great. If you don't, that's okay too. If you're just looking to like look more demographically and just like look at everybody, uh, then you can be more adapt adaptive and uh, do some post hoc analyses to separate these engagement groups. And so examining player behaviors across time is one way you can do this. Uh, and so an example of what we did, looked at another facet grid, uh, but, but I, we looked at uh, the average time that players were playing uh, per day, and it was around 30 minutes for the TCG. Uh, and we, just to note, like, you can have, you can fix players' time play however you like. Uh, you can choose to have players play one to two hours a day. If, if you need to get like them through content where you're like, okay, we, need, we know it takes 20 hours to get to mission five and we wanna have all these insights from mission one to five, then you say, okay, you have to play two hours a day. You can do that. If you're looking at retention, that's not the way to go. Uh, if you wanna know about retention, you let them play as they would in their daily life, right? You can't force somebody to play two hours and be like, did you drop out? Like, did you not want to drop out? That just doesn't work that way. So you have to be really conscious of that whenever you're asking and prepping your study. So that's something, just a side note. But for ours, we let them play. We say, hey, play the game if you want. If you don't want to play it, you don't have to play it. Um, and so we found that there was two groups, two significant groups. Those are above 30 that we forced into this uh, dichotomy. So those above 30 and those below 30. Uh, and they were, very, they were experiencing the game very differently. And so one thing you can do, this is <laughs> way too much text, and I apologize. But this is something that we would do in a report where we're looking at the groups in uh, those, uh, we're looking at unique qualitative responses based on which group you're in. So are the players that are playing less than 30 minutes experiencing something different or reporting different problems than those that are, exp that are playing more? The answer is usually yes. There is unique differences than those that are playing more and those that are playing less. In our case, we found that those that are playing less than 30 minutes, the two biggest unique issues that they were experiencing were problems with progression and problems with the Fatui. So they were, they were bouncing off the Fatui, they didn't, they didn't understand the game. Whereas those that were playing more than 30 minutes, their bit, two biggest issues were randomness within the game and progression. So both groups are experiencing problems with progression. That's insightful. That's really good to know. But those that are dropping out, those ones that you want to retain, are likely the ones that are in the less than 30 minutes group that are experiencing Fatui issues. So you now have two problems. One's global and one's specific to the players that are dropping out. How do you action on that? That's your next step, right? That's the exciting stuff that you can, you can build on. This is where I get, this is the only really technical stuff I, I, that like is, is multi-level modeling, but this is an example of what you can do as a researcher to do this. I would not report it in, in this way, and I will reiterate that, do not report it this way. But this is how you kind of go through the process of running a multi-level multi -level moderation. Uh, and so anybody that's unfamiliar with moderation, it's uh, interactions. So you're, like, you're comparing groups and seeing whether or not they differ in the way that they respond to X and Y uh, based on what group they're in. And so this is what, you would, what you're seeing here is the daily averages for all non-TCG players. So each peak and valley is, is corresponding to that day. So that's just the average of the day. And so we're comparing these two groups, right? So we have TCG players are in the orange and then non-TCG players in the blue. So we're seeing there's a stark difference here in how motivated they are to unlock cards and to build new decks. So I wanted to look at just two different motivations in the metrics. And this is important for games where you're like, this is one of the drivers of why players are playing this game. You want to assess that metric and how motivated pe people are to play that with that metric or uh, that mechanic. Uh, and so, yeah, it looks like, yeah, there's a difference between TCG players and non-TCG players, kind of actually going away what you would in, with what you would anticipate. You'd expect TCG players to like a TCG game more than non-TCG players. Um, and then building decks, you're also seeing a bit of a difference here too. So you want to investigate this. You can't really see it. I apologize for that. I'm actually worried because they're going to be blocked on that one, but we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, so again, let's get some spaghetti on the on the plate here. Let's uh, let's look at uh, spaghetti plots and see what's going on. You can just get a good idea here of the, of the differences in what their scopes are and what their regressions are. These orange lines, you know, there's heavily weighted lower. Um, there's a lot more negatives, and then just like you know, it's just a good benchmark of what's going on. Same thing for the build new decks. You see it a lot lower, uh, but you would see upward trends if you were looking, if you could see the bottom right. Um, so yeah, these are the regression lines for each individual player. And this is where you actually run your multi-level moderation, okay? So you have a lot of indicators that you're, you're, there's something going on here. Um, you'd be running some background, uh, other stats to get this going, but you run your multi-level moderation. I would, this is, this is just my preference. If you're running Python or R, 
if you have missing data, I have not found a good workaround for Python. Um, if anybody has good workarounds, let me know. I was trained in R, and I've only used R for missing data. It's the only effective way other than like using list-wise deletion, which is horrible for this kind of analysis, if you're using Python. Um, yeah, we can talk about that. Um, but anyway, um, so looking at unlock cards, we found a main effect. So, so for anybody that's unfamiliar, a main effect means there's difference between the two groups, but they're, they're not experiencing it differently. Okay, so both players are experiencing the motivation to put unlock cards. It's kind of just middling. There's no significant like increase, but non-TCG players are significantly more engaged with unlocking cards than those that play, that play TCG. In this hidden little graph, you have to use your imagination here with me. Um, you're gonna see that you would actually see that TCG players are significantly increasing across time in their motivation. So they start low. And then as they play the study more, they're more engaged with building decks. Whereas those that are non-TCG players, they start high, but then they start going down. And so there's a significant interaction here. This means that they're experiencing the game differently. They're experiencing this motivation differently and significantly. So this is really cool. This is where you say, there's two different groups of players that are experiencing this, this motivation to build new decks in a very different way. Why is that happening? You can investigate that and look at qualitative data to understand and, and, and maybe follow up with interviews with those players to understand it more. Very cool. That's all I just said, yeah. Um, I guess I'm just blazing through this. Um, so most frequent daily issues, this is another thing that I just like. I wanted to kind of highlight, it's a, it's a cool way to look at your data and I think it's, it's great. You can look at the biggest concerns on each day and plot the most frequently uh, reported issues and really get an understanding of what, when these issues are occurring and get a better understanding of your data. So for example, day one, learning's the biggest issue. Unanimously, people are like, I don't know what the hell's going on. This, this learning process is confusing. The Fatui is confusing. But then as you get f further down the study, gameplay becomes the prevalent issue that's occurring across the time, right? They're like, ah, oh, the game's fine, but like, this is an issue that I have with the gameplay. This is nitpicking at the gameplay. And then you'll see that progression then starts to take over at the end, where it's actually progression is becoming the issue now. They're like, OK, I've gotten the gameplay loop. After a week, now I'm understanding there's a pr progression wall here, and I don't like it. Uh, and so that's what. I think is really insightful here is, is being able to look at those. And obviously, you know, if there's there's a couple front runners, you can also report those. You don't have to just stick to the, the most common. So to wrap up, um, don't display the results exactly like I did. This is not a report that you would give to people uh, that are non-researchers. I was trying to, to kind of bridge that gap between, you know, showing you the process of, of getting this data and what you do to kind of like understand your data, but don't do spaghetti plots. They're, they're a mess, don't do them. Um, don't show them, rather, do them. Um, be scarce with graphs and plots. That's the feedback we've gotten from a lot of people is just, you know, don't overutilize your graphs and plots. You think they're cool, we all think they're cool. They don't think they're cool. Um, anybody outside this room doesn't give a shit. <laughs> um, avoid confidence intervals on plots. That's also a unique feedback that I got. Our designers and other people were like, okay, what's, what is this confidence interval? What is going on? And explaining confidence intervals are fun and all, but like, um, sometimes it's confusing. If it makes, if it's really valid for your point, I definitely think it's like something, if you're talking to researchers, definitely don't disregard this. Run it always, but maybe don't report it uh, in your, in your, you're deliverable. And then, yeah, don't use plots that cannot easily tell a story. So don't do the spaghetti plots. Don't do the other plots that are confusing. And I would, you know, stray away from any, like, regression plots as well. Like, this is not something that you're going to want to be able to explain to people. And they won't understand it whenever they're looking at the report on their own. You don't want to have to hold their hand through the report. So why did I spend so much time on MLM, MLM analyses? Our job's not to, uh, to guesstimate based on visualizations. It never has been, it never will be. Uh, and so we don't wanna just be showing visualizations and, and interpreting them for people. Uh, we wanna do our due diligence. And so as researchers, we have to get the statistics correct when reporting findings. All that background work is what we're paid for. We're doing that because we're right, <laughs> not because we're doing pretty graphs, right? And so we know that we're informed by proper decision making and correct analyses. And my takeaways, uh, I hope that you have a better understanding of intensive longitudinal methods. If you didn't know anything about it, I hope it's a little <laughs> clearer. Um, but if you, know, if you had considering da running daily diaries and you haven't really considered using a mixed method approach, I think that this was you know, maybe an introduction to that and there's a lot of materials that you can go through to do that. Uh, you can talk to me if you like. 
Um, and then understand the steps of an intensive longitudinal method from study conception to final report. I tried to hammer it home. It's, uh, there's a lot you can do. That is like, that's a multi-day workshop. Um, but yeah. And then last, understand the importance of Im implementing multi-level multi models. This was kind of my goal here. Uh, I really do hope that we can have more conversations about like what analytical approaches we take and why we take them. Uh, theory is important. It's dry. It's boring. Uh, and there's a lot of work behind it. But really, like, as long as we understand why we're doing it, that's the main point. And then just don't disregard these things whenever you're like, now you know, so you can't go back. <laughs> you can't go back to, to OS and being blissfully ignorant, ignorant right? Because you now know, so you should do your due diligence. Uh, that's all I've got. That's a really small contact page. Um, this is a resources. Uh, this is a book that's really phenomenal if you're just trying to dip your feet into intensive longitudinal methods. Uh, and there's some cool, like, uh, presentations that really just define in depth what uh, multi-level modeling is. Uh, I didn't touch half of, or I didn't touch 10% of what multi-level modeling really is, um, but there's a lot of like really cool resources that you can get a really good idea of what's going on uh, with that data. And that's it, that's all I got. No worries. Repeat the question. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Uh, thanks for an awesome talk. Thank you. Um, I, in your example, you're seeing this individual per group. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the considerations of like sample size and yes. um, what data you talk about on p-values and then whether that factors at all and maybe is that important in your plan? Yeah, it's, it's in the background. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, for sure. Why, why talk? Uh, yes, no, I think it's a really good point. OK, yeah, I'll talk. Oh, sorry, I just, I was just told to repeat the question, and I did not do that. So I'm gonna <laughs> repeat your question, and then I'll respond to you. So the question, twofold, right? So two, two questions, um, the first being on um, why, like, considerations of sample size, and then the second one being about p-values and like where, they are, where those are, and what, what consideration I should have for those. Really good, really good points. Sample size, phenomenal question. Uh, Long-running discussion in multi-level modeling and how to use the data effectively. Um, I would highly recommend aiming for 30 to 40 as a minimum, uh, not per group. You don't have to do per group. I would say like if you're doing group comparisons, try for 20. Like I, I think that's like my b baseline, what I would do. The, the main thing here is that we are very, uh, there's always been a concern that like it's a low sample size, but you're disregarding the the amount of observations that are occurring. And the, and the benefit of multi-level modeling is that you you really do, and if you have 40 people that are have to do 20, like across 20 days, uh, can I do my math, <laughs> 800, 800, you have 800 observations to work with. That is really strong, like, like from, a, from a statistical standpoint, like the power is improved across the, that sample because of those observations, and you, just want to make sure that you're like getting that right. But yeah, so I would say there's no hard and fast rule on how many you should because of the observations increasing the, the strength of your, your uh, results. But yeah, it, it adds a lot. It adds up quick. Because once you start adding 10 more, 20 more, 30 more participants, you're now adding hundreds of more observations that you need to, qual like to, to code. So yeah, I'd say try for 40. Uh, if you have the resources to do more, do it. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> I would definitely do it. Uh, and then, so for the the second question on p p values and significance, yes, I mean that you could. I, it, there's always a balance between critical, like what's important to the team, what you think is impactful to the team, and what's like 0.05. Uh, and so avoid that, like oh, it's on the border. Like definitely don't go go that far. But you're looking at effect sizes. You're looking at the different relationships that are occurring. It's a part of the pie but it's not the whole thing. Um, it's a good indication that you're flagging something as it could be significant, but I, if it's just at, at 0.05, uh, you know, you gotta figure out what's critical for your team and what's actually an impactful insight. Yeah, it's a good question, yeah. Yes, John. So, um, curious about what the baseline data uh, for confidence is like at the start of the study. Have you ever looked at, so for example, this is user data, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Phenomenal point. Um, so the question is about whether or not you'd basically run prelim, like di- basically prelim diaries, yeah. yeah, to like get a baseline of the, what the players are doing, what their motivations are on maybe different games, um, and so that kind of gives you the the leniency to be like, okay, I know what my players are about before I gather the data and I start analyzing the data on them. Yes, you definitely can do it. It is a good way to do it for some studies. Some it might not make sense. Um, I've done it plenty of times with um, like couples, like in couples, right? So you can get like baseline. One example is uh, we we use text messaging. Uh, we looked at how people support each other through text messages. And so what we did was we observed them for two weeks, but we collected the month before worth of texts. And so that gives you that baseline before they're being observed. Um, really the benefit to this is that you, you want to get data that they were not a part of a study in. So if they're a part of a study, they're like aware they're being observed, they're like, their reporting is going to be similar. So it's tough to like justify necessarily running daily diaries for like other games, unless you have like pre-existing questions like that you want to s- investigate of like, I know these are players that play Apex Legends, so I want to get them and I want to get them to do an Apex Legends like preliminary like daily diary so I can get to see how they play. And then I want them to switch to whatever game I'm, I'm testing now and see how it differs in their satisfaction or motivation. Because they might be motivated to play Apex a similar or a TCG game that's similar to yours in a different way. And there might be like more incentive to build new decks or interact with cards and you might get that insight. That could be really cool. Okay. Yeah, it's like a competitor analysis like right. diary study. Yeah. Or intensive longitudinal method, sorry. I, I used it, I hate it. Um, yeah, yes? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And like that's cheaper and because it's like is it actually high stakes as opposed to just like I mean I'll be honest with you, I know enough statistics that I can generally cheat my way into any giving I want, right? If okay. It's just like the line goes down versus the line goes up, like I wanna do the math. When when you're doing line goes up, line goes down, you're using quantitative though, right? Like you use it. I just look so I graph everybody, I look at their lines as I'm looking across time and yeah. I'm like, yeah. And I can do a certain amount of different angles and then go through and do the spread on Yeah. Yeah. But like why as opposed to just looking at the graph and being like is this really the same as on Okay. Right? Okay. Um I'm going to try and repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> uh the question being, you know, more or less why are we doing all this uh when you can kind of like look at graphs or look at the the quantitative like visualizations uh, when you can just kind of do qualitative and like kind of bin those on your own, like just like eye, eyeballing it. Mm-hmm. I would say uh, it's a good, it's a really good question. Um, it comes down to more like uh, what your pre-existing hypotheses are and like just, being good, like, it's kind of like that pre-registration vibe where it's like, you had questions going in, test those questions, but then don't be afraid to explore your data. Uh, and I think that quantitative analyses, it's, it's, a, it's a fine trade-off because you're saying like, I, don't, I only have so much time and I have qualitative data that I want to kind of highlight for like why this is going on. But it's also really important to just, I, I think it is pretty quick. It, it, once you get going into the quantitative analyses, you can run these pre-existing hypotheses. You can pre-code these. Yeah. If, if you were, I'm, I'm not talking about things that don't pay anything. I'm talking about post hoc, right? So I yes. can give you an example. Right. I go through and I've got open world players in the game, and I'm starting looking at their base movements, and I'm looking at item base movements. Yep. I look at them, there are behavioral patterns 
Mm, you got cl different clusters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I wouldn't that be uh, so? It's like t basically doing confirmatory factor analysis to like, find clusters, opposed to just looking at the qualitative data and grouping them. Um, and doing it post hoc is like, why would you do that qualitative or quantitative approach? Yeah. Uh, um, it's it, it's it's a good. Uh, this is more of like a you know theoretical discussion that like I, I would love to chat more about but like I think that there's value in um, <laughs> I wouldn't suggest running confirmatory factor analysis on like on, and do cluster analyses every time you run a study like this <laughs> uh, but I do think that there's certain benefits to um, exploring your data and having pre-existing that's that's really all I can really say but let's, let's chat more I, I think your points are valid sure. yeah yeah yes uh, Oh yeah. Oh, wonderful, wonderful question. Um, that that reason. Sorry. Oh, God, I'm good at that. Uh, are there for people that are just starting their journey in longitudinal assessment and and wanting to get into it? Is there any like resources or things that I did that were really beneficial? Is is kind of the question. Um, it's a great question. Uh, yes, there's a lot you can do. I think that that resource, the intensive longitudinal methods uh, book, is a really easy to read and understand. There's also the resources that I included are really a good benchmark to get into that. Um, getting to know regression, if you are interested in this stuff, is definitely a baseline that you, would, you should do. Um, you should understand why regression is important and what predictors are, uh, and then build from that. Uh, so you're really just kind of like, you got to think of it as, and simplify it, because it can be really complicated. And it doesn't need to be. You're, you're, there's different groups that are non-independent. And I think when you really come back to it, it's just think about how you, your data can be similar or correlated to each other and account for it. Those are the main things you need to account for. So yeah, keep that in mind when you're learning and don't get overwhelmed because it's really easy to get overwhelmed with that stuff. Uh, and, and ask people, there's people, I'm here, uh, you, you can shoot me a message if you need to. Um, but there's lots of resources as well that you can check my slides for. Yeah, great. Uh, when they when they drop out early, what are we doing with the the participants? Um, there's different approaches, so it depends on when they're dropping out. Um, if it's like a first or second day, I, you use that. You could still use that data, but it's not going to give you much. Um, and that's why missing data protocols is really important. So like how you manage the missing data is important. Um, so if you're running like analyses and you have a bunch of dropouts that are different time points, that's why you would you you wouldn't use li listwise or pairwise because you might just like just destroy all that, that, that information. Um, I would use a different approach for missing data. It's like maximum likelihood. Um, it just accounts for what data is existing. So it basically takes the data that you've, you've provided and allows you to use that and not like just cut it all out so you don't lose it. Uh, there's a way more technical way to explain that, but I'm, I'm not gonna approach that <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful question, really good question. Uh, the question was, why would you run OLS or regular regression uh, if data points are always correlated like from day to day? You don't when you're doing repeated measures. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, linear regression is good at predicting things. Often cross-sectional studies are best, of, most effective for that. So when you're doing one time point, you have everybody's a different person. So regressions, are that's what they're for, is to, to predict those times where there's no um, where every, every observation is independent. 
So each person's giving you a new insight. That's great. Use your, use your linear regression. So that's like almost every study, <laughs> except for repeated measure studies or things that you're like, you have clusters. All it really is, it really is just to boil it down. It's quite simple to run multi-level regressions. It's just, you're just including like the fact that you're clustering a, on a group. So you're like saying you need to account for time as, as a thing that is, is correlated. And that's what that differentiation is when you're running it. It's really not too complex to run them. It's just knowing what, what variables are going to be correlated with each other. So time and then person. So you're literally just saying the person, the ID, and the time are correlated. So account for that in this analysis. And that's what that regression is, an uh, MLM regression is. Yeah. So it's really quite simple to do. It seems a lot weightier than it is. Um, but yeah, you'd run it if, it's, if every, every data point is independent. You'd run a linear regression that's OLS. Yeah, yeah it's a great question. So technical, everybody's like so, te it's, it's so fun to have these technical conversations, everybody. I think everybody's ready to move on. <laughs>